episode three of the acolyte is going to break star Wars with a complete redefinition of the force. As we go now, you've gotten to the story at this point, the two sisters and they're being raised by a coven of witches, all women. So these are the two mothers who bore these twins. Don't you just love it when wild spreading rumors actually turn out to be true? Yep. Chris Gore warned us all. Yes, there is a lesbian birth in the third episode of The Acolyte, but is that the worst part of it? Or was there something even worse lurking in this episode? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the raging dumpster fire that is Disney's Star Wars. Before we get into this, make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out with continuing to grow, and it's totally free. Much has already been said about The Acolyte, Leslie Headland's brainchild. The first two episodes made quite the splash across the interwebs and is causing quite a stir among the remaining fans who are left rage watching this. And that's really all that's left. YouTubers like me and people rage watching it to see how bad it can truly get. You know, it's kind of funny. The other day I received an email from Disney Plus asking if I was interested in signing up for three months at 99 cents a month. Brilliant. I'll tell you what brilliance in advertising is, 99 cents. Somebody thought of that, Campbell. Yeah, at least someone opened up and looked at the financial statements, and at least they're scrambling to do something about it. But I don't think 99 cents a month is going to do much. But Darth Kathleen Kennedy is as strong as Darth Sidious was. So it'll be a while before we can purge the poison out of Disney. For now, though, we're treated to rage watching for clicks and views on our YouTube channels. And as I've explained in this prior video, the mainstream media is blaming fans for ruining Star Wars, not the people at Lucasfilm pushing queer, feminist agendas. But I'll get to that later, believe that. The third episode takes us back in time 16 years to see how female Rick James 1 and 2 came to the Jedi's attention. Apparently they were birthed by a couple of witches in a lesbian coven. Listen. I'm actually all about the lesbian community. Obviously, they talk amongst themselves, and the word got out that I'm a friend of lesbians. You're a friend of lesbians? Yes. I feel that the lesbian community is pretty awesome, and I'm all about supporting them. Chasing Amy was a damn good movie, but I don't think it would work in a Star Wars context as we're seeing now. But Leslie Headland is gonna try anyway, so we have the long-rumored lesbian birth, which... I don't know, man. It's been a while since high school biology, but don't you need a man to take care of that business? Anyway, so the Jedi show up, try to test the female Rick James twins, and the witch coven tells them to lie during the test. Afterward, female Rick James number one passes the test to start the, her Padawan training, but female Rick James number two isn't having any of that and decides to burn down the whole witch coven, including her two moms. And speaking of the two moms, we totally get a discount version of Senua from Senua's Sacrifice. Kind of disappointing if you ask me because Hellblade was a damn great game that totally deserves a film adaptation, but I digress. Throughout the episode, we get a healthy dose of fourth wave feminism and the shitty dialogue continues with female Rick James expressing her disdain for becoming a witch. If you can't see the blatant agenda, let me show you what I mean. The galaxy is not a place that welcomes women like us. Witches who have the abilities we do. So Discount Ethnically Diverse Witch and Discount Senua start complaining about the patriarchy in a galaxy far, far away. How about you quit bitching about not being equal? Let me hit you with some cold hard stats. Most women outnumber men in colleges and higher education and are now out earning men. In fact, for the past 10 years, Women have outnumbered men in U.S. medical schools. You did it. You won. But Leslie Headland is so entrenched in her own New York City bubble that she simply can't see facts. She can't see numbers. And I bet she even has TDS. Oh, oh I know. You're a tough guy, Jeb. And, it's, and we need to have... How about the rest of the episode? Well, the acting is absolutely atrocious. I understand that actors need to get experience in order to get better, but these people haven't even taken acting lessons. It's just diversity hires all around. It also doesn't help that the dialogue continues to be written in the colloquial 
instead of proper language as in the original trilogy, as I mentioned in my last video. And don't think that it's just because it's 2024 you can write colloquial dialogue because that's the style. Uh, what about Dune? May thy knife chip and shatter. Denis Villeneuve proved that you can have properly written dialogue in modern sci-fi. But I guess Leslie Headland failed creative writing 101 at Oberlin. I mean, she completely changed what the force even is. Oh, great, now it's a thread? Yeah, okay, Leslie. I don't really think she knows anything about Star Wars. Has she even watched any of the other Disney Plus shows? I mean, never mind the original trilogy. At least those were slightly better written. But hey, we are graced with the presence of Qui-Gon Trinity once again, because I guess old Carrie Ann Moss needed a paycheck since those Matrix residuals might not be covering the cost of that Botox. And hey, we got to see the only good actor on the entire show, Jedi Squid Game, and even Jedi Chewie. So I guess it's not all bad. Wait, what the hell am I talking about? <laughs> the show is completely fucked six ways from Sunday. Instead of good writing, we get a jumbled mess full of various different progressive agendas and a healthy dose of Disney trying to raise your kids for you. I mean, the scene where Discount Senua tells her that she's old enough to know what she wants is truly laughable. She's old enough to know what she wants. This is the same sort of immature approach to life that all woke millennial hipsters adhere to. Actually, scratch that, it's bigger than that. Progressives seem to think that children can make their own life decisions. Decisions like certain surgeries and certain puberty hormone blockers. Don't think I don't see what you're doing here, Disney. As I mentioned in my last video, Disney has the gall to try to raise other people's children because they think they know better. You know who else does that? Communists. If Leslie Headland wants to live under the communist rule so badly, why the hell doesn't she just move to China? Oh yeah, that's right. They're not really a friend of lesbians like Larry David and myself. Another line that really got me was this one. The Jedi are bad. The Jedi are good. This isn't about good or bad. This is about power and who is allowed to use it. This isn't about good or bad, it's about power? Wow, holy shit. This isn't even subtle anymore. This is the wokest woke that ever woked. Straight out of the campuses of Yale University and Amherst College, we get the progressive narrative that power and the quest for power drives everything in race and gender relations and is the root cause of all the world's problems. These academic frameworks of critical race theory and intersectionality, as well as feminist and queer theory, analyze and critique societal structures that perpetuate inequality and oppression. And this is shoved down your throat hard in episode 3 of The Acolyte. I guess the Jedi are the oppressors in the world of Darth Kathleen Kennedy and Harvey Weinstein's assistant. Yeah, great role model. This whole cockamamie theory focuses on how power dynamics are embedded within legal, political, and social systems, maintaining the dominance of privileged groups over marginalized ones. Here we see the oh-so-evil Jedi trying to take children away. Since when do Jedi crave power? I guess ever since Leslie Headland wrote about it in her Swarthmore senior thesis. God, she wouldn't have made it two seconds at Penn State or Alabama. Roll Tide! The point is that all these Bryn Mawr and Mount Holyoke rejects seem to have a very myopic view of the world. They're taught Marxist theory whose sole focus on class struggle and economic power relations significantly influence discussions about systemic inequality and exploitation. That's why we're now seeing the Jedi as this post-colonial evil entity looking to exploit the galaxy for their own nefarious purposes. Well, if the Jedi are so evil, what does that make the Sith? And then Jedi Dalsim Yoga Flame shows up, but the episode shows nothing about why female Rick James number two was so pissed at him in the prior episode. Honestly, this show was written by the product of the American Liberal Arts College System, or AI, I don't know. Maybe it's time to stop hiring Williams College and Columbia grads and start hiring some military veterans, as I mentioned in my last video. Maybe then we could get some good Star Wars stories, because as it stands now, the intersectionality is strong with this one. But what do you guys think about all this? Does anyone even like this show? And is the franchise dead? 
please do let me know down below in the comments and as always hit that like button ring that notification bell and smash that subscribe button and i'll see you in the next one